Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. We're your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week, we explore a different perspective on or experience of depression because it varies in form and severity, affecting us differently. Our guests share intimate details of their struggles, coping strategies, and recovery. We keep it real because the struggle is real. We keep it hopeful because there is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We're not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and know that talking about the illness reduces stigma and humanizes the experience, making it safer and easier to ask for needed support. You are far from alone. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. As you frequently hear us say, we can learn so much from each other. Mm -hmm. Many of us may have this illness called depression, but some of us experience it seasonally, while others seem to bear the dark weight nearly constantly. Some describe their depression as one aspect of a stew of other illnesses. And then there are the differences in how we manage and understand the disorder, even what we call it a mental illness, a mental health challenge, a mood or psychiatric disorder, a disease, or maybe even worse, maybe we sometimes believe it's just who we are. We reached out to today's guest because like many with depression, he also lives with anxiety. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, many people who develop depression have a history of an anxiety disorder earlier in life. There is no evidence one disorder causes the other, but there is clear evidence that many people suffer from both disorders. In talking with Jordan, we also got to explore post-surgical depression a bit. So here is Jordan giving his voice to depression and anxiety. It's not mainly depression that I deal with now, but it it definitely... Um, uh, it was a couple of years ago, I'd say from the years 2012 to about 2014, maybe 2015, uh, I was dealing with it. And the one thing that I can think of that probably set it all off because we uh, we talk about how you may have the genes, the underlying genes, but they're not actually turned on until you have some kind of stressor. And so I think the stressor in my life was open heart surgery. Jordan was only 24 when he received the surprising diagnosis of a congenital heart problem. And I had always been so healthy. I'd been an athlete. I'd been a sprinter, soccer player. And so I, I never thought something like that could happen to me. Uh, and in so, that moment, it kind of felt like uh, my life was almost taken away. And it gave me a totally new outlook as, uh, as people are wont to say. It's kind of cliche at this point, but it is absolutely true. Uh, I remember the moment waking up from coming out of surgery and just having this almost spiritual moment of, uh, wow, I'm alive. Like, I, 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 where was I? Jordan describes that experience as a rebirth and a huge wake-up call. It was also the start of something darker. And so everyone told me that it was the physical recovery that would be so difficult, but it was actually the emotional recovery that was a hundred times more difficult than any physical recovery. Um, And the emotional recovery looked like just feelings of intense shame that I didn't know where they were coming from. Uh, So I've always had intrusive thoughts, but these were just a whole nother level. Um, And I think that really triggered some pretty serious depression where I didn't feel like getting out of bed. I didn't want to go to work. Depression after heart surgery is so common, it has its own name cardiac depression. According to the American Heart Association, about 25% or one in four people who undergo heart surgery will experience depression as a result. That number is especially significant because the AHA advises that a positive outlook can help with healing. So the association recommends that people who are undergoing heart surgery and their families learn the signs of depression so they can get treatment if they present. It's worth noting that you can have post-surgery depression as a complication from other types of surgery as well. So again, it's recommended if you have emotional symptoms like hopelessness, agitation, or loss of interest in activities that last longer than two weeks, make an appointment with your doctor to be evaluated. So I, it's interesting. I am not being treated for depression. I always thought I could do this on my own. Medicine doesn't really work. 
I had very bad experiences with medical professionals. No one really uh, listened to me mm. or thought that I had anything of value to say. They were more the, I'm the professional. You're going to listen to what I say, and that's why you're here. You're, you're just sick. Uh, it's when I finally got a good psychiatrist that said, oh, it's, it definitely seems like OCD. And so they prescribed an SSRI for it, Paxil, which I'm still on. And that helped so much. It's unbelievable how much it helped. It helped with the intrusive thoughts. They just kind of seemed to melt away. And that really took an edge off of the, just some of the darker modes of thinking. Wow. I'm glad it worked. Yeah. So the anxiety, describe that for me. It, so it's this thing where I guess if you don't live with it, it's really hard to describe it because I've had people try to name it when they don't have it. And it's really not the experience at all. It can be very, very debilitating. It can be racing thoughts. It used to be, like I said, those really intrusive thoughts. So out of nowhere, I'd be reading a book and then I'd have the strange thought that I'm a terrible person or I can't believe I did that in sixth grade. Why did I do that? So things that just wow. don't make sense would come back into my mind. So if, um, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, um, half, let's see how to say, it's not uncommon for someone with an anxiety disorder to also suffer from depression or vice versa. Nearly one half of those diagnosed with depression are also diagnosed with anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to understand about anxiety? Because if half the people we know with depression also have that, you know, I, I will confessionally admit that while if someone said to me, don't be sad or what do you have to be sad about? <laughs> I would I would really not like that. <laughs> but I have a, a relative I spend a lot of time with. And if I had a dollar for every time I said, you know, it doesn't help to worry. Now, she's never been diagnosed with anxiety, so I'm not sure I really had that sensitivity. But now that I was reading to research to talk to you, I was like, oh, no, I've been doing it to her. And I felt terrible. Yeah. So, So what do we need to know? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right with that, <laughs> that uh, it kind of goes just like depression, where you you don't want to say to someone, uh, stop being sad. Uh, you definitely don't want to say, stop being anxious or calm down. Calm down may be the worst. Uh, I Ugh. And everyone does it. Uh, even with my wife, I, I think in one point said, calm down, not thinking about it. And that was that was the wrong thing to say. I'll just tell you tell you that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, so we, we both have anxiety, so we're kind of two peas in a pod, and we get one another. Um, but I think I see a tendency in others who haven't learned to talk about it or don't know what's going on that they see someone get anxious, or, uh, and then they become anxious, and then they just want it to stop. And then they, so they'll just say whatever because they think that it will just get it to stop, and it's a matter of fixing it. Um, but – I think, yeah, as you know, it's it's not something that's just easily fixed. It's more of a process that needs to be worked through. And so I I think the biggest – one of the biggest things I could say is that it doesn't have to make sense to you. You just have to understand that it is real for that person. They are experiencing some kind of um, inner pain, anxiety, emotional issues of some kind. And it's better to try to understand the, the underlying emotion and speak to that emotion rather than uh, try to label it or fix it immediately. So should we ask questions? Should we, assuming you know the person, you know, a gentle rub on the back, is it the same kind of conversation I would want someone to have with me if I was really depressed where it's just, I'm here, you know, I'll be here for you. Let me know what you need. If you and I are out to whatever lunch and I notice that you are really becoming anxious, what's my best move to support you? Yeah, it can be tough depending on how well you know a person. But I think to have that curious open stance is that when other people become anxious or depressed or have any kind of emotion or symptom that we don't really understand because with mental illness, behaviors or symptoms, and that still scares us for whatever reason because I think we don't have enough training, we have enough education about that, is to to be curious. I think what you said is great. Asking questions is a good way to start. You can, as you're talking uh, in a non judgmental way, say, Oh, it sounds like you're feeling frustrated. It sounds, you could start, try to name uh, the emotions. You could say, Is that right? Is that what's going on? And then let the person fill in the gaps. Uh, I think it's a, a mistake to think that people who are dealing with this 
just want it over with, don't want to talk about it. But I actually get – I find a lot of solace in uh, talking about my emotions. And like I said, I'm a verbal processor, so maybe not everyone will. Um, but to to be kind, to be curious, to, to listen, to really uh, be okay with silence. I think in working a couple of mental health jobs, going to grad school for social work, one of the most powerful – tools you have in your toolbox is the power of silence. And that often seems like, well, I'm not doing enough. I'm not fixing this for them. I need to be doing more. And I know some of the, actually, I was going to say dads, but moms and dads that I've worked with, they both want to to fix whatever pain mm-hmm. their child is going through. You, you, your child's not asking for that. They just kind of want to feel understood. And you can honestly do that just by listening and um, not saying very much at all. Now, again, this is coming from a place of naivety, but before I knew more about depression, before I started this, I was taught, I believed that if you brought up suicide to somebody, you know, if you asked them, are you having suicidal thoughts? Are you thinking of killing yourself? That you were increasing the odds they were going to. And I now know that's not true, that it's a a letting air out of the balloon, giving them the opportunity to speak and be understood and and be honest. Um, Mm -hmm. But I have, and this, I'm asking you if this is a misconception or, or if it's correct, I have been conditioned to believe that if somebody is feeling anxious, that if I bring more attention to it, that I will increase that for them. Is that correct or not? Probably depends, but it's a it's a good question. I think it's a little more nuanced than that. I, so I'm thinking, and this is just for me. Everyone yeah. is different uh, with how their anxiety plays out. But I don't like when if I'm obviously anxious and someone really critically points it out is like, "Why are you doing that? Stop doing that!" And the, or they'll try to just kind of smother whatever I'm feeling. That's not helpful. Mm-hmm. But I also know, and I know from just working with a lot of people, talking with others, friends. People who live with anxiety, they do a, a really job of hiding it and just putting on that mask and trying to pretend like it's all okay. Uh, and eventually it, it does show a little bit. And I think when someone actually tries to enter that space with you and connect with you and say, you know, like, I really am here. I want to learn and talk about it. It is such a huge relief, at least for me. And I've, I know because I think it's so rare because whatever in our t- technological age, people don't want to connect like this anymore. Uh, we don't have as many meaningful conversations. But when I can really uh, meaningfully engage with someone and, and ask them how they're doing on a basic level, it mm-hmm. just I, it cuts right through it. And I think it, it leads to creating a, a safe space. So uh, it, it's absolutely OK to talk with it, just like you said. It's OK to talk about suicide. Is there anything when I asked you to to do this interview that you thought, oh, I'd like to say this, or this is something I'd like to communicate? Hmm. I will maybe just end with a touchy-feely thing and say that whoever's listening, whatever you're going through, wherever you are, um, I I think that's valid. And you don't need others to to tell you that it's valid or not. You know yourself best. Um, So you may have times, like I did, where you had to fight for healthcare, and you were told that you were stupid. And uh, psychiatrists who had years and years of experience uh, treated me badly. And I think the the best knowledge you can get is self knowledge and learning to know yourself, um, because it's only by knowing yourself and working on yourself that you get to know the world a little better. At least that's what I've learned. And so I, I hope whoever is listening to this that that resonates because it absolutely has been true for me. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for your time. I'm, um, I think I have a slightly better understanding. I will continue to do the research because until I started, I didn't know it was half the people with depression also have anxiety. I think of the Venn diagram and I know that, you know, anxiety and, uh, you know, um, God, bipolar, you know, are, the, are those three are make a lovely little clover. Um, but I, I didn't realize it was 50%. So I appreciate you talking about it and helping me understand it better. That's how we learn, right, Bridge? Absolutely. I've never even heard of post-surgical depression, and I've had it. I didn't even realize that was what it was or exactly. is a thing. We both talked about it, and, and we both, you know, the last surgery I had, I came out of it, and I said to the nurse in recovery, am I supposed to be this sad? And I was just crying, and as you know, I'm not a crier, and I just thought, what is this? And it was quite a while before it lifted. So, yeah, I was really glad to hear that, and, you know, it's just another one of those things that 
if you understand it, you're not as afraid of it. Exactly. And I think we should close with what Jordan said, to be kind, to be curious and listen, Mm -hmm. and that silence is okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Bridget. Bye, Bug. Bye, Bug. (laughs) And we'll have to stop saying calm down to our shared relative. Yes. 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 Sorry, Mom. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) She's listening. She is listening. Still sorry, Mom. We love you. We love you. Love you, Mom. All right. Bye. Bye. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on Depression's Dark Road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.